now we are live on youtube sir i'll just uh, share my screen Kamau is joining. Dr. Roy, Professor Mohanty, can you hear me? Good morning to Am you. Am I coming through? Yeah. How are you? All well? Yes. Thank you so, so much. Uh, let me get things going here. All righty. Uh, okay. Yes. Oh, nice seeing you. It's early morning. <laughs> yeah. Six o'clock. Everything good? Good, good. Wonderful. Thank you for putting this together. Uh, nice, nice seeing you. Wonderful to see you. So sorry it can't be in person. Uh, hope everyone is well. I see all of our dear, dear friends here. Uh, yeah. Prof. Maria, Dr. Uh, Dana Sekren. Such wonderful friends and great opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Shashank. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Okay, thanks. Thanks for joining. <laughs> you are perfectly on time. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me, sir. Okay. Mohanji, good evening. I think all of the join will start. Dr. Ronan, we can start now. I think so. All are in. Okay. Uh, dear friends, uh, good evening to you all. Uh, greetings from Indian Orthoplasty Association. Now we started in 1995 and this is the year 2020. So we completed 25 long years and this year we are celebrating our Silver Jubilee year. And unfortunately, because of this pandemic, our celebration of Silver Jubilee year landed up in, you know, web celebration or virtual celebration. We all started with uh, doing a webinars uh, just to disseminate the knowledge about the orthoplasty during this pandemic year. Please visit our website, that is www.indianorthoplastyassociation.com. And please offer your suggestions to improve our webinars or our activity by sending an email at indianorthoplasty at gmail.com or in my personal ID, email ID, Dr. SS at hotmail.com. I am Dr. Subran Sumanti, president of this association. Now, today, this is the Indian Orthoplasty Association 360 degree webinar series number nine. And it's devoted to total knee orthoplasty in rheumatoid knee. We are fortunate to have Dr. Ronan Roy from Portis Hospital, Kolkata, and who is the vice president of Indian Orthoplasty Association, along with Dr. M. Ajit Kumar from Tejashwini Hospital, Mangalore, and who is also the vice president of Indian Orthoplasty Association, to be the conveners for this excellent webinar. We invite our guest speakers. Our first guest speaker is, you know, Professor Christopher Mao, and he's a clinical professor in Stanford University Medical Center. He's the Associate Chief of Staff and Deputy Chief of Department of Orthopedic Surgery. He has been ambassador to Asian Orthoplasty Association, honorary member of Thailand Hip and Knee Society, founding patron of Indonesian Hip and Knee Society, and international advisor for of the Asia. Welcome to you to this webinar. In spite of the early morning in California, you have been able to join to our webinar and we really extend our heartfelt thanks to you. Now, Dr. Sasang Akrekar, 
is the practicing consultant rheumatologist at Mumbai Arthritis Clinic and Research Center at Vandup, and he's also attached to Fortis Hospital and Bethany Hospital. He has received the Young Scientist Award by the Indian Rheumatology Association. He had received a lot of fellowships and awards to name few. He has uh, delivered the guest lecture in American College of Rheumatology in 2015 about Twitter in Rheumatology. He has got pioneering work in health-related internet uses and also has registered a Guinness Book of World Record on World Arthritis Day 2016. Dr. Akrekar is the rheumatologist who will, you know, enlighten us about the perioperative management during rheumatoid arthritis. We always need a rheumatologist as our friend and, a, you know, friend in need, like a friendly neighborhood, you know, Spider-Man. And Dr. Sashank Akrekar is the Spider-Man, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man for us today. We have our own Dr. Sanjeev K.S. Maria, who is the Chairman and Chief Surgeon at Max Institute of Musculoskeletal Sciences and Orthopedics at New Delhi. He has been the past president of Indian Orthoplasty Association, Indian Orthopedic Association, Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons, you know, Asia and Secret Knee Section. He was the best postgraduate of PGA Chandigarh and uh, he has authored nine orthoplasty books and 92 papers to his credit with, you know, citations in the yearbook of orthopedics, Campbell's Operative Orthopedics, and Rockwood Green's Fractures in Adults, and these are the routine books we study right from our postgraduate days. He has been a member of uh, many boards, has been written here, and we welcome Dr. Maria, our own past president, to enlighten us with his, you know, more than 40 years of experience. Besides our guest speakers, we have our own faculty, Dr. P. Dhanasekar Raja from Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore, Dr. B. D. Chacharji from uh, Apollo Clinical, Kolkata, Professor Pradeep Bhosle is the Director of Arthritis and Joint Replacement at Nanavati Super Speciality Hospital, Mumbai. And he is the you know, ex-professor and the head of the department of KM Hospital, Mumbai. And Professor Mohan Desai, who is at present professor and a consultant joint replacement surgeon at KM Hospital, Mumbai, who will enlighten us to different aspects of arthroplasty in rheumatoid knee. Dear friends, without losing any time, let me hand over you know, the webinar to our conveners, Dr. Ronan Roy and Dr. Ajit Kumar, please, to go ahead with this uh, fantastic webinar. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. We'll answer all your questions. We'll have a fantastic discussion. And within the faculty, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand and Dr. Ronan or Dr. Ajit Kumar will take your questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Shubhangshu. Thank you ever so much. And, uh... Welcome everybody to the IA 360 degree arthroplasty webinar series. Basically, we're going to try and take a 360 degree look at uh, total knee replacement in rheumatoid arthritis. And we've got an exciting array of speakers lined up for you as uh, Dr. Uh, Mohanty has just outlined. And to set the ball rolling, I'll call Dr. Shashanga Krekar, who's going to tell us about the perioperative management in total knee arthritis, in, in uh, total knee ar uh, arthroplasty. So over to Dr. Shashank. Thank you all. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, webinar. Let me share my screen. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I'm really happy to be a part of this webinar because uh, taking care of rheumatoid arthritis and rheumatoid knee arthroplasty as a team always works, works better for the, for the patient and works better from our side also. So when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis and TK, the major concerns I'm sure for, all, for us as well as the orthopedic fraternity would be one, the surgical site infections, non-surgical site infections, which would be the deep other organ infections. As, as expected, RA patients are at twice the risk of developing infections, regardless of the treatment, as compared and regardless of the site of operation, as compared to the non-RA population. Risk of DVT, risk of MI, and most important, the risk of flare-up of rheumatoid activity if not taken care of. 
generally what are the ongoing medications that uh, a rheumatoid arthritis patient would be who would be for uh, posted for tk one nsaids steroids dmards biologics and occasionally other immunosuppressants most of the patients in today's uh, era mainly are on dmards biologics as i said occasionally immunosuppressants a few of them obviously would be on steroids but generally in today's age the steroids when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis are not in a very big dose generally they are in the you know uh, something that is equivalent of prednisolone of 5 mg or 2.5 in most of the patients unless there are some other specific indications let's have a look at each every drug to understand how, how what we do with these medicines in the perioperative or post of uh, pre or post of uh, stage coming to methotrexate methotrexate has been and is today the anchor drug as far as rheumatoid arthritis is concerned is the most common dmard that is used and also the dmard that is used in combination with most of the biologics so theoretically being an immuno modulator immuno suppressant it can definitely increase the chance of infection as well as delay the healing process on the other hand if you look this is the chance of infection and delay of, uh, delayed healing but on the other hand the risk is of ra flare if methotrexate is discontinued why should we worry about ra flare because if the patient flares a post op i would be as a rheumatologist i would be forced to give steroids which would then nullify the effect of you know stopping methotrexate to begin with pre op so we have to balance these two things what does uh, the evidence suggest continuation of methotrexate most of the studies there haven't been a there, there is not a lot of data that is available as far as the pre op and then the post op complications of dmards in in tk and tha are concerned but whatever few studies we have continuation of methotrexate does not increase the risk of either infections or surgical complications within 1 year of elective orthopedic surgery this has been shown by grannan dm et al and one more study by sri kumar et al which reexamined the same population of patients at 10 years from surgery and found that continuing methotrexate in the long term was not associated with any additional case of deep bone infection where so so the moral of the story is methotrexate need not be stopped prior during or post surgery it can be continued in the same dose the only place where would be where we would be a bit cautious in there would be some patients who have underlying renal dysfunction where in the bod, the creatinine is borderline and they are on methotrexate in these patients during the surgery the creatinine may fluctuate the renal function may fluctuate may deteriorate and in that case these patients can end up with methotrexate toxicity if the creatinine goes up so only if the patient has some underlying renal dysfunction even if it is borderline these would be the patients wherein we would like to stop methotrexate as you can see one week pre op one to two weeks post op and then continue if there is no renal dysfunction in between how about leflunomide leflunomide again theoretically it can increase chance of infection and delay healing there have been quite a few studies on both sides a few of them showing increase in the chance of infection a few of them not really pointing to any increased chance of infection patient are at risk of ra flare again uh, uh, sorry for that methotrexate this is if if leflunomide is discontinued the final consensus as of now is there is no dramatically increased risk of post op complications if leflunomide is continued so as far as leflunomide is concerned we can still continue leflunomide pre op intra op post op as far as hydroxychloroquine and salicylate is concerned not even immuno suppressants they are plain simple immuno modulators and they can be continued pre op intra op post op these are the american college of rheumatology and american association of hip and knee surgeons guidelines for pre op management of uh, anti rheumatic medications so as we just discussed methotrexate sulfasalazine hydroxychloroquine leflunomide can be continued pre op intra op post op the second group of agents that you most of you would be coming across in patients are biologic agents these are the newer agents that are used in rheumatoid arthritis management as far as biologic agents are concerned there is a definite higher risk of post op infections with these agents 
amongst the biologics one cannot separate biologics based on the infection risk more or less they are similar when it comes to infection risk if you look into details as to when to stop them when is the risk high patients on biologics are at an increased risk of infection which is time dependent what do i mean by time dependent the risk peaks immediately following the treatment commencement after giving a particular dose but subsequently decreases to the level of ra patients who are not treated with biologics over a period of time so by the time the the time of next dose comes the risk comes down to equivalent to those ra patients who are not on biologics and surprisingly it has been found that as far as uh, uh, thromboembolic risk is concerned those on biologics had increased risk of vt compared to non biologic treated ra patients this probably is because these patients have higher disease activity as compared to the ra patients who are not on biologics so when it comes to biologics uh, I, let me just go through the list of the names of biologics first adalimumab which is available in india is exemtia adalipka adfrar the common brands that are available itanercept enbrel something that i am sure all of you would have seen in patients golilumab simpani infliximab remicade again i am sure all of you would be aware abatacept orencia sertolizumab simdia which is not available in india rituximab rituximab may have been given in the past see rituximab is generally given today and again after uh, 15 days so it may not be an ongoing medication but when you see make sure that this is seen because it could be have been given 3 months 4 months 5 months beforehand before the operation tocilizumab actembra which is given monthly anakendra is not available in india secupinumab is not even not secupinumab ustekinumab belulumab all of them are not really used in rheumatoid so other agents make sure i would always be uh, emphasizing make sure as the patient whether he has taken these taking this or taken this recently so the dosing interval of these biologics vary every biologic has its own dosing interval and the best time to do a tka is just prior to the next interval so something like suppose if adalimumab is taken every 2 weeks the best time to do go ahead with the surgery would be just after 2 to 3 weeks of the prior injection in 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 the case of infliximab it is either 4 weeks 6 weeks or 8 weeks so at the end of 4 6 or 8 weeks whatever cycle the patient is taking that would be the best time to go ahead with the uh, uh, surgery so that the risk of infections is minimal coming to the other immunosuppressive agents most of the ra patients are not on these immunosuppressive agents but an occasional patient may be on these agents mycophenolate azathioprine cyclosporin tacrolimus these agents as you can see these are mainly used in lupus occasionally in ra the guidelines are if the patient has severe manifestations which is true with sle not generally with rheumatoid if they have severe organ manifestations we should not be stopping them but if it is not severe no organ manifestations we can continue so in most of the rheumatoid arthritis patients we can continue these medication pre op post op uh, intra op as well so uh, just a simple chart if a patient with rheumatoid arthritis who's on treatment with dmards or biologics comes for a knee replacement if it is only dmards all the dmards can be continued methotrexate leflunomide sulfasalazine hydroxychloroquine apremilast azathioprine cyclosporine as we saw immunosuppressants can be continued for all practical purposes if the patient does not have if rheumatoid arthritis is not associated with severe organ manifestations interstitial lung disease which is very active vasculitis which is active then we can definitely continue uh, we can discontinue mycophenolate azathioprine cyclosporine tacrolimus otherwise they can be continued if it is severe manifestation tofacitinib and baricitinib these are two new oral biologics they need to be discontinued one week prior to surgery and for all the other biologics most of them are all parenteral agents so it is best to plan surgery at the end of the dosing cycle that way the risk of infections would be minimal coming to the other group other uh, group of uh, medicines that are there in most of our patients nsaids we uh, as all of you know nsaids can be associated with the risk of bleeding it is advisable to hold withhold nsaids pre op for a period of 
period which is equivalent to five half lives of the drug and restart them two to three days post op there have been multiple schools of thought as far as this is concerned and not everybody stops but technically paracetamol and opioid analgesics are better nsaids preferably can be stopped steroids a few patients of rheumatoid would be on steroids the issues with steroids secondary adrenal insufficiency due to suppression of the hp axis poor bone quality you obviously are a better judge risk of infections definite increase in the post op risk following tja for long term use of glucocorticoid but if you see the dose is if the dose is more than 15 mg most of our ra patients are generally not on a dose of prednisolone for an elective surgery which is more than 15 mg wound healing obviously can be an issue if the steroids are there again with low dose it should not be so much of a problem one of the important things that to note is if the dose of prednisolone or equivalent is less than 20 mg prednisolone they should receive their usual daily dose rather than the stress dose in light of the effect of infection risk so that is something that is important we need not give that extra dose of hydrocortisone of 100 mg 50 mg or solimedrol just prior to surgery which was the concept in vogue some time back so finally it's best to optimize these patients pre op for the best results it is obviously a team approach to get into a touch with the treating rheumatologist so that all that can this can be optimized and we would have the best results of the replacement for the patient it is always good to have rheumatoid well controlled before going in for the surgery if you speak to the rheumatologist he can taper and stop the steroids if possible so the risk of post op complications post op infections re- is reduced to minimum in fact there are so many patients who are not willing to stop steroids despite coaxing from our side so you can use that replacement as a you know sort of a carrot for the patient that stopping steroids would reduce the complications and this could be a motivator for the patient to stop that steroid that small dose of steroid that he has been you know clinging on for a long time if the patient is on biologics definitely get in touch with the rheumatologist and plan it accordingly this has to be even from my side as a rheumatologist we plan this in detail with the patient so that it is you know the the op- the operative procedure is planned at the appropriate time lastly discuss if there are other issues if the rheumatoid also has interstitial lung disease if the rheumatoid has vasculitis and if the rheumatoid has cervical problems obviously this is something that uh, would be very important to discuss beforehand and lastly uh, there are a few rheumatoid arthritis patients who are rheumatoid not just rheumatoid but overlap it's an overlap of rheumatoid plus connective tissue disease so they would have some features of connective tissue disease this needs to be taken into consideration before operation so these are the few things that that i would suggest from my side as as the pre op optimization thank you very much thank you dr akrekar that was a very lucid presentation on uh, the med- perioperative medication of uh, management of uh, rheumatoid arthritis and uh, I think to put it in a nutshell, you can say that the traditional demands can continue during the surgery. If you ha- if the patient is on biologics, then it's best to see a rheumatologist to see what needs to be changed or tapered or held withheld as required. And uh, uh, beyond that, uh, other if there are other associated complications, then obviously these will need to be optimized before the patient is actually taken up for theatre. Well, thank you very much. And uh, 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 I don't see any questions on this coming up. I mean, uh, it's actually extremely clear cut. And can, I, can I ask one question? Please, please Pradeep. Yeah, uh, very interesting, nice lecture. Um, one issue about uh, activity level of rheumatoid. Can you just elaborate more on this in relation to surgery also, and how to determine the activity of rheumatoid and whether surgery should be avoided during that time yeah we generally assess the activity one by tender joint and swollen joint score and there is a score called as das best is to take a patient who is in remission or low disease activity and second most important thing is the knee that is inflamed it's better to wait for some time let the inflammation settle down fully and then go ahead with the surgery that that would be the the 
absolute suggestion from my side uh, but there are no parameters to assess the activity level like uh, the rheumatoid it, factor uh, the if you see the what is the range of uh labs don't really help rheumatoid factor uh, in fact if we do it once we don't even repeat it it doesn't correlate with the disease activity yes value, CRP value, good measure, value, also, value of rheumatoid uh, not really yeah, titer so, is not important not really rheumatoid factor and anti ccp in fact we say it is to be done only once for a diagnosis and beyond that only there is a specific need there is specific indication for doing the test the titer of the rheumatoid factor or anti ccp will not really reflect the disease activity esr crp are good but they may not always reflect the disease activity the best measure of disease activity is a score Local. called as das which is a, a calculated score taking into consideration the total joint count the swollen joint count the esr and the patient uh, the patient uh, uh, vas score that is the best but that is again a generalized thing as far as a localized knee inflammation is concerned best to ensure that the knee is in, you know absolutely quiet before going ahead with the surgery i think dr dhanushekar raj has actually got some uh, googly slant for us later on this evening anyway with the esr and crp can i can i ask one question please yeah um, uh, sasanka uh, you know some people they are on injectable methotrexate you know uh, yes. that also needs to be continued uh, or uh, is there any difference between tablets and injections no so the difference between tablet and injection is only of bioavailability so what we do is generally uh, when when is a patient shifted on uh, subcutaneous or intramuscular uh, methotrexate is one we feel that there is an issue with bioavailability patient is not settling down with optimal dose of oral methotrexate and second if the patient is not tolerating oral methotrexate but otherwise for all technical purposes both are similar we need to continue it pre op intra op post op and uh, there there was a literature in a couple of years back i think might be old they were telling if it is less than 10 mg we can continue more than 10 mg it is better to stop is there any dose dose related uh, you know thing uh, which can affect post operative uh, you know wound healing not really in fact okay. when we were students we used to stop this even as of yeah. now there is some school of thought wherein we stop we stop one week prior uh, and restart one week prior if the wound healing is okay that is something that is practiced even today but the recommendations as of now say and most of the evidence that we have got till now say you can continue methotrexate in fact if methotrexate is stopped there is they have shown that there is a 10% uh, 10% of the patients may go into a flare and a flare would mean adding steroids later on which would you know ultimately nullify that effect of stopping right. methotrexate to begin with and these guidelines have been 2017 guidelines of the acr american college of rheumatology that we can continue and if the patient is on steroids then do mm-hmm. we need to give a, you know bolus dose of steroids before surgery no again that is exactly what i had pointed out initially we used to give in fact what happens is the practical challenge so many times is on the day of the surgery when the patient is nbm we are not able to give that morning dose of steroid so if we can manage that or give that dose one day prior at night it should still be sufficient that concept of giving that high dose of hydrocortisone as a stress dose or methylprednisolone no, no longer holds true now correct thank you, thank you. Uh, i i would request if you can uh, continue staying with us yes. so that in the case discussion so there will be some issues we can discuss uh, definitely i'll be there okay. i'll be there thank you and that will be great perfect well it's now my pleasure to call on dr maria our former president to address us and he's going to be talking about tackling challenges in rheumatoid arthritis and uh, with his vast experience i think he'll probably be able to give us a bird's eye view of all the problems that we have in tk surgery in rheumatoid over to you dr maria so you need to unmute yourself i've done that i've done okay, that okay thank you can you hear me okay yes. friend it's uh, thank you very much for having me here today and i before i start on this i must say 
the first book I wrote on top on the left, the foreword was written by none other than Dr. Christopher Mao. It is a very nostalgic moment for me. So now uh, when I am going to talk about this topic, I'm going to talk about the difficulties that one is likely to face, complications which can come up if one is not careful right from the beginning, that is the pre-op considerations. But always remember when you are taking up these, usually they are younger patients. And please don't forget you're dealing with a patient with a systemic disease and not just the knee. Also, when you are examining the patient, look at the spine, the hip and other joints. Don't look at that juicy knee which you want to replace as soon as possible. Don't forget, almost 60% of these patients can show up spinal involvement and we will be hearing more about the hip, but I'll just go around very briefly. The hip could actually be the cause of most of the pain in the knee. Even when the x-ray looks bad in the knee, one must clinically evaluate the hip, see the range of movements and see whether it is pain-free. Don't just jump once again to the knee because patient keeps putting the index finger onto the knee. The pain is here. The x-ray shows that there is reduced joint space and you quickly want to reduce and operate this. Also, don't forget that you need to have adequate movement at the hip when you're replacing the knee joint as you need to flex the hip considerably when you're doing the procedure at the knee. And also, the exceptions when you may have to do the knee before the hip is when there is severe valgus deformity, in which case, if you replace the hip first, you might just end up with a dislocation because the knee is in an awkward position and when the patient is being nursed or when the physiotherapy is being attempted, there is a reasonable chance. Of course, a lot of improvement is there with the large head and large ball sizes of the hips, etc., and the kind of dual mobilities, but still the principles should not change. Also, if you have both knees and both hips involved and there's severe deformities at the knees, you might consider doing one side together. This is not the most common thing, but you can do the ipsilateral hip and knee, get one side out of the way, and then six to eight weeks later, that is our protocol, you go to do the other side. Now, that is as far as broadly the planning thoughts to be kept in mind, but when you're going inside the patient, you need to have your implant sorted out reasonably well in your mind, but at the same time, you should keep all kinds of implants around you. You never know in which ditch you are likely to fall. Nonetheless, usually you are okay. And it is well agreed that cemented implants are usually the chosen implants for this. In fact, for knee replacement even today. However, the cementless ones are gradually coming in. Various registries, including the Swedish one, is showing a favor towards cemented and the advantage is that you can use antibiotic loaded cement, especially when there is no renal disease or creatinine, et cetera, is fine, which we do tend to use. Now, should you use a cruciate retaining or cruciate sacrificing? It's up to you, but there have been reports Then, when you try to retain the cruciate, the synovium may still be inflamed around it and gradually it bites into the ligament. There have been papers like the one quoted below which has shown 50% patient showed instability at eight years after a cruciate retaining knee. And at the same time, there are papers which disagree with that. However, when the deformity is severe, it is better and easier to use the cruciate sacrificing knee. We tend to use the PS knee. Patella. Now, most people have their choice. I replace patella, I don't replace patella. But if you want to be one of those who would like to be a selective replacer, I suggest do replace the rheumatoid patella because it is said the remaining arterial cartilage provides antigenic stimulation for inflammation, the cartilage on the patella surface. It is known to cause anterior knee pain and studies has supported replacement of patella in rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory situations. We do replace it when the thickness of bone uh, permits us to do it, a very thin patella is best left alone for the fear of causing fracture. When you're exposing these, remember the skin in these patients is thin, atrophic and stretched out, so respect it. 
try and remove as much unhealthy synovium that you can see. If you are finding it difficult to evert the patella or to bring the tibia in front, you may choose to do a quadricep snip rather than avulsing the patella ligament, which in my mind is as bad as an infection or perhaps in terms of a result could be worse. Bone quality is often not too good in rheumatoid or chronic rheumatoid patients due to the inflammatory process, chronic use of steroids, disuse atrophy of the bone, and long local prostaglandin release, which causes inflammatory process. You can see these are rheumatoid patients. And the upper picture, it shows you that there, there you, somebody, just one of my colleagues, ran the saw through this because it was so soft. So the best thing to do was we used an ethy bond. This is a trick. Use the ethy bond, take it to the uh, side of the uh, condyle and tie it there. Because if you're going to cement it, you don't want cement going down into that cut. So please be sure that you have a pa parallel smooth surface. Second thing is secondary osteonecrosis can make it look like owl's eyes lower below where the cysts have been removed. And these have to be taken care of, preferably bone grafted. Normally, you do tend to get sufficient bone out. But if these are big, then don't hesitate to use an intramedullary stem to give additional stability. I will just talk a little bit of these uh, various deformities, of what is to be kept in mind. For valgus, you have to assess how severe is it. Now, it's interesting that we have to see, look at that, the lateral structures are tight, medial are loose. So you have to focus, interestingly, on the medial loose structures. Are you, how, what equipment you need, what implants you need, and to correct the balance or get the square inside between flexion and extension gap, you might have to do certain lateral releases. I'm sure it's coming up, but you can do pie crusting of the lateral capsule. If there is tightness and extension, you do an ITB release, whether you release it over the tibia or you do pie crusting again. You Popliteus is the last one you need to hit. At the same time, the lateral collateral ligament is helpful. Even this can be done a pie crusting if both tight in flexion and extension. In, in these severe valgus knees, the important thing to see now, I will show you also remember the lateral condyle release or epicondyle release has also been talked about where you can shift the position of the lateral epicondyle down. Similarly, if you want to tighten on the medial side, you can shift the medial condyle proximally. That's the Krakow technique. Nonetheless, let me now just show you a few cases. Look at this patient who had rheumatoid arthritis. So what was so exciting about this? It looked pure valgus knees. But my friends, look carefully. Look at the ones on your right side. This is not pure valgus. This is serpentine. The effect is valgus, but this is serpentine tibia. Now, if you can use CAS, it's an ideal indication to get your mechanical axis right with that. If you're not a CAS user, use an, you will have to use an extra medullary jig, which most people are using on the tibia, and make sure you get that alignment right. So that is terribly important in this kind of a situation. In a varus situation, you need to think of Again, some release for exposure where the medial structures are tight. And the extent will again depend on the deformity. Quite often, you tend to use the scalpel on the medial side and release it. But in these situations, you may be better advised to use a fine, sharp osteotome and take a periosteal flap. So that when you have released it and you put it all back, you may need considerable release. It will go and stick back nicely as compared to cutting it out with a saw. There are knees where you will find they're very flexible and floppy and the skin is very loose and so are the ligaments. This is called pseudolaxity of the joint due to the maybe the joint surface wear out or the ligaments due to huge amount of synovial inflammation, etc. In these cases, remember not to go beyond the mid-coronal line, especially on mid-coronal plane, especially here medially. So don't go too far back, otherwise your knee will get very floppy and a knee which you can treat with a PS knee, you might end up have to use using constrained implants. Aim is to get your rectangle correct. Now flexion deformity or any deformity, remember one thing. 
always do a pre-op evaluation and a per-op evaluation where pleasantly many times your deformity will be far lesser because it was due to pain and inflammation that the patient was unable to straighten it. With this, you find that patient can under anesthesia give you the true deformity and your usage will depend on mild, moderate or severe below 15, 15 to 30 or 30 degrees. But in all, there are different types of implants, broadly PS up to 30 degrees. And if you are finding too much laxity, do keep constrained implants like CCK and PC3 around with you if required. And in very rare situations, if you're totally off balance, you might even require hinged implants. So how much to correct on the table? Finally, you should in grade one, you are almost able to correct it fully. Gray, unlike osteoarthritis, where you must get full correction on the table and not trust that nature will do the rest. In this, up to five to 10 degrees or in, you will find nature can definitely do the rest in inflammatory situations. And certainly post-operatively, you need to keep these knees flexed for a while to save the biggest problem and that is lateral peroneal nerve injury due to the stretch. So post-operatively, what I want to say is look out for neurovascular status as soon as possible. And at any stage you find in the recovery that there is some doubt, immediately loosen the bandages, flex the knee to 30, 40 degrees, leave it like this and hope that the recovery starts coming soon. All being well, patients, this is, rheumatoid patients are an ideal situation to use gutter walkers with your elbows because many of them have difficulty with your elbows and shoulders this has to be kept in mind. You cannot just walk off having done the knee and saying, okay, let him walk with walker tomorrow. Specify it. We have already heard that the incidence of infection, et cetera, is much higher. These are very interesting papers. We talk of increased infection rates, et cetera. These are well-known things. And uh, there are predictors, et cetera, which are very well-known. And th there is no technique in this. You have to take the precautions, et cetera. But antibiotic loaded cement is a good one. I'll just show you a couple of these. There's a 68 year lady, rheumatoid. Look at that, focus on that stress fracture here with a severe rheumatoid valgus knee. So this is a situation, some may want to do it in two stages, some may want to do it in one stage, both are right. However, you have to be careful when you're taking this because these are a very flexy kind of situations. And if you're putting, you're doing that corrective osteotomy and in one stage, if you're putting the long stem, it should be nicely snugly fit. You are cemented nicely, but if you are cementing this, you have a danger of actually putting the bone, uh, the cement into the osteotomy site. Here is the situation. Uh, and this one particularly at four and a half months did very well, full weight bearing. Another 58 year old, severe virus, but here don't go to the uh, left one, look at the right one. And here, right, this is the right one. Look at this and what was the thing? Look at the lateral view. The lateral view shows a deep hole here. So now this deep hole has to be addressed separately. You can use different these things, but you can even use a block or a wedge. But in rheumatoid, a block or wedge has not shown that such good results. It's a good idea to prepare it nicely. The medial side, you put bone graft, but this won't take all the load. You take a sleeve or a cone. I use the sleeve, you can see, it has protected it nicely. It is holding it well. Also at the same time, loading the gap just enough to stimulate healing. And there you can see that this one is doing well. And this is at the post-operative stage. It is done fairly well. Finally, 63 year old, not walking for four months with a stress fracture. Look at this stress fracture. Now, a lot of temptation, but you have to think, can I save this big piece of bone? With rheumatoid, the joint is so bad. After shaving the top, do I have enough bone to save or do I remove it or do I put a uh, limb preservation system? Well, we thought let's preserve this and we did manage to preserve it. However, in our over enthusiasm, I'm sure many of my colleagues who are so excited to look at this beautiful picture missed something and that was look at this periprosthetic fracture here. So this patient was put in a brace. We didn't have the heart to go back to this thing kept the patient for three months in a brace oh, and the patient was okay. The last stop is always take a history of al allergic situations. If the patient must be asked, do you have allergy to metals? If patient has, there you do the patch test. In this case, we found 
allergy to nickel and chrome, went ahead and used another implant. This is, uh, which I mean is talked about as Boldney, but this is titanium nitride. And this has given some very good results. We use it only when at the moment in case we get this kind of a history. This is cementless. Now let me tell you, even a well done cementless knee, we have had seven instances cementless knee in situations where we thought the bone was not too good and we have no regret. In conclusion, understand the systemic nature of the disease and involvement of other joints. Respect the soft tissues. Remember, it's a multiple, multidisciplinary problem. We just heard the first talk. Dr. Akrekar was point straight on the nail. Keep a wide range of implants in OT and don't make too many problems and treat the knees. Don't just go to treat the knees, try to treat the entire thing as a patient, but also take health for systemic. And finally, it is nothing but a team approach without which you cannot succeed in any surgical endeavor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maria. I mean, that was a real bird's eye view of the entire problem, to be very honest. And, uh, to set the ball rolling, sir, I, I'd just like to ask you a question. I mean, you know, as far as CR and CS knees are concerned, basically you have people who are sort of, uh, you know, almost blinker, who do only CS and the others who do only CR. Now, in a rheumatoid situation, when you, if you're planning to do a CR, is there anything that you would do sp specifically to try and see whether your ligament is intact or not? How would you of assess course. the integrity? What you are trying to retain is the posterior cruciate. Correct. And you can actually see it. And if you want to retain it, one thing you can do is keep the arthroscopy probe with you and put the probe and try to feel the tension with the probe. And that is before the cut. And after the cut, you again put, take two spacer blocks, not one. Put the two spacer blocks so that you can approach the ligament get the 10 millimeter or whatever you want to get in, in, in your eight millimeters in case of a lesser in case of CR. Once again, feel that ligament. Palpation, palpation is the answer. And if there is rheumatoid uh, or synovial, uh, synovium around it, which we are all very familiar with it, if you're going to do, take a nibbler and very gently nibble it off. There's no other instrument which is safe to remove that. However, they still remain, because whenever you say you've done a synovectomy, it's always a partial. You can never do a total synovectomy. In my experience, it's a slightly exaggerated misnomer. Uh, can I have a, ask a question? Yes, sir? Please. So in case of a rheumatoid patient with a small anatomy, uh, are we justified in doing a PS knee or we can do a CR with a deep dish? Uh, what is your suggestion, sir? See, uh, there, there is no problem. You in uh, The thing is, you need to get your balances right. And if you got your balance right, everything will work. Even with the deep dish, I mean, I am sorry, I have to mention some names like NK2. Uh, I mean, it works fairly well even here. And over a period of time, there is certain amount of capsular reformation and etc. There is certain amount of stability. But if you have you got to find a system and that's what you need to keep. There are systems which we also use, which go down right to size one. So we keep, we go with that we will do this and one in a hundred, you not just rheumatoid, any knee, you need to put that. Sometimes you open a knee, which looks quite big. It's like, you know, sometimes you open a walnut inside, you find a very small, this thing. So it's like that you find a small thing. That is where you need to have in your theater all these things uh, if you're doing volumes. You should be able to, uh, there's not an instance today in a fairly large number where we have had to abandon the procedure or overhang badly. If you have to overhang a couple of millimeters, go laterally, not medially. We all know that. Thank you. Any, any further questions from, yes, Bidi. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, hello. You can hear me now? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah question, Dr. Maria, uh, considering the fact that most of these patients are severely osteoporotic and many of them have been on steroids, uh, do you tend to stem these uh, joints more than you would otherwise do? Yes, slightly more. I did mention, but <clears throat> I also get carried away a little bit by how much, how much defect we have, if at all, on the condyles. But the, my way of realizing this is I take a knife 
if i can dig the knife into the tbl condyle i'll use a stem if the knife goes in a, not a 15 blade a proper 23 24 blade if it goes in easily or if a, you can push a blunt osteotom without pressure then you need to put a stem uh, uh, i have a question and a comment uh, yes can I? Yeah. please you know uh, regarding the you know, last uh, suggestion by dr maria what i do i try to rotate uh, the tbl component by hand uh, whether it is rheumatoid or any osteoporotic bone if it is rot i can rotate little bit here and there then i put a stem always maybe a small stubby stem of 30 mm or so um or else if it not i am not able to rotate it, it is quite stable then the trial component then i don't put a stem now my question is you know many times you get post tcr synovitis in patients otherwise rheumatoid or other patients you know you get synovitis maybe you know due to polywear or something like that uh, then you change the polyethylene and all these things uh, how in rheumatoid arthritis you differentiate polywear uh, from a you know uh, inflammatory synovitis of the rheumatoid per se because you are not doing a complete you know synovectomy anyway Subram, so I think let's leave this when we are doing talking the Dr. Dhanushekar Raja's case. We can talk about that. No, that is that is about infection. Uh, I'm telling polywear in synovitis. Yeah. So can I, uh, Ronnie? Please, Dr. Malik. Please, please. Okay. So now the point is that uh, first thing is this has got to be many years down the line if you are suspecting a difference between these two things that you are saying polywear and this. In which case, I you have two options. If the knee is stable, it's comfortable, then you need to do an arthroscopy. You need to talk to the patient that I'll do a small process pro procedure, and you're likely to get quite comfortable. But many years down the line, you may need it again. However, if inside I find that your the insert or the thing between the two metals in your knee is showing wear and tear, then I might have to go in and do another procedure, change it, and do a bigger synovectomy process, which can only be done by open. But more often than not, the arthroscopic one will again give five seven years, which most pe people are willing to take if they don't have to go through that expense of pain and money. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maria. Well, uh, if there are no more questions, I'll move on now to our guest speaker from the U.S. Uh, we've got Dr. Chris Ma, who's an old friend of the IAA, and he's with Stanford Medical School, and he'll be talking about constraint total knee replacement in rheumatoid arthritis. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Can we get here? Everybody see this? Yeah. Okay. Um, this has been wonderful. It's such a great opportunity to see everyone, all these great friends. And sorry, we aren't have been able to see each other this year. I think this is the case everywhere globally. Uh, this is usually our meeting time in the fall uh, with the uh, your nation's meeting, China's meeting, Thailand's meeting is going on virtually this weekend. Uh, there are many of them, and I think we've all gone to virtual formats. But I commend the IAA and all of you for putting these webinars together and keeping us together and in, to engage despite the uh, circumstances that we're all in. Uh, it, it certainly looks, at least in this country where I am, we're not going to be getting out of this anytime soon. So uh, we better get used to this kind of format. So it's just wonderful to be here and really, really honored that uh, you, you guys have asked me to be here. And uh, uh, so to, without further, uh, these are my disclosures. These are Chinese companies. Uh, so uh, just a little bit of background. Um, the overall, I think we all agree, oops, sorry, that um, the case numbers of RA for total joint have greatly decreased thanks to the drugs. Uh, that Dr. Uh, Akrekar had showed us this morning. Uh, in some series, it said that the, uh, um, it's, uh, the indications for total hip and total knee have decreased up to 40% compared from the 1980s to the 2010s. 
Uh, I trained at Hospital for Special Surgery. I think Pradeep has also. Uh, he is here. Uh, and in our day, uh, there was a spe specified total joint service under Dr. Ranawat for rheumatoid cases called CAP, CAP Comprehensive Arthritis Service. From my understanding, talking with Matthias Bostrom, this has changed to uh, more an overall arthritis service because the rheumatoid cases have decreased so much. In a 2016 series from Mayo Clinic uh, of complex total knees, only 5.6 were from uh, inflammatory arthritis. In general, as we've already heard, the reported outcomes and long-term follow-up studies for RA have generally been excellent. Uh, this study from 2013 it was a large U.S. database study of over 350,000 total knees. Only 3.4% were for RA. Infection rate was, of course, shown to be higher, as we've already seen from the first speaker. Otherwise, there were no differences in complication rate, including fracture. The RA patients tended to be younger and female. Uh, studies also uh, indicate that implant survivorship may overall be slightly better for RA than OA, presumably due to lower demand and activity level. And this is a recent study from the Danish registry. Longer term follow-up studies have some, have showed a reported higher incidence of periprosthetic fracture. And that was an excellent discussion by Professor Maria on stems and the prevention of fracture in the complex cases. However, surgical challenges remain. And I think this talk is a good segue to Professor Maria's talk uh, to in, in, in dealing with the constrained implants, especially the stem part, because a lot of systems in order to go stem, we need to have a constrained implant. So uh, as we just saw, correction of severe coronal inflection defor uh, deformity and flexion contractors, ligamentous instability uh, due to massive releases to achieve correct alignment or attenuation, as well as the se severe osteoporosis and erosive defects, which we just saw some excellent examples. So uh, the brief history of constrained options, it was first introduced in the late 1980s. Uh, Dr. Insall brought this in with his CCK design in the late 80s, and also the deep dish or ultra congruent designs that we heard a little bit about as well. By now, of course, there's a lot of options. And in the 2000s, uh, some uh, companies came in with an intermediate constrained option, pretty much a beefed up uh, uh, intercondylar post without changing the box on the femoral side. So uh, the constrained, uh, primary total knee uh, has gained popularity, at least in this country recently, because the, the, repairing a ligament in any circumstance, RA or not, is not very reliable. The sports guys do this, of course, and they're acute injuries, but in the setting of a TKR, this has not been reliable nor widely practiced. Constrained implants were introduced in the late, 80, uh, late 80s and early 90s to address this problem. And the, but the indications for the use of constrained implants is still somewhat unclear and controversial, but I think we would all agree that it, with the severe valgus knee and incompetent MCL, which we saw in a few cases, uh, is a good indication. It is a modification of a posterior stabilized design with a higher and thicker tibial post. Usually this is reinforced with a embedded metal post or bar. Uh, there's a corresponding wider, deeper box cut on the femur. Uh, it can be substantially larger depending on the manufacturer. So this gets into Dr. Donna Shaker's uh, question about the smaller implants and whether to use it in, in a small patient due to the amount of bone that may need to be removed. It allows for two to three degrees of varus, uh, varus valgus and rotational freedom, which is quite a bit less than the standard primary posterior stabilized implants. It can also be used to address uh, asymmetrical flexion instability and mid-flexion instability to some extent. The concerns are that with that degree of constraint, is there going to be uh, increased rates of loosening? And we'll take a look at some of the literature. Potential implant failure at multiple modular junctions. Tibial insert dissociation, especially if a locking screw is used, has been reported. Polywear, especially on the post. And the literature still remains limited on this subject. Uh, the necessity of mandatory stem augmentation on the tibia and femur was just discussed. This literature is growing, but still limited. There is definitely an added morbidity from the increased surgical time, uh, but if it's necessary, it's necessary, and I think we've all agreed that in certain cases this needs to be done. 
The intermediate constrained option now offered by most manufacturers also may have a role if we don't need to go to a full constraint. Preoperative planning we heard about as well. I won't dwell on this too much. Full length films, examination, including what Professor Marias had said under anesthesia is important to see what the true extent of the deformity is. Bone defects was covered already in the last talk. Uh, just a little bit about the technical dis uh, aspects. Once decided to use constrained implants, additional steps are necessary. It is recommended that a, at least a small stem extension is put on the tibia, as Professor Mohanty had just discussed. Uh, most systems have contoured stems in case you need to go very long and the stem and the, the canal is bowed. How much stem, stem extension is necessary is not well defined. But a minimum extension at 30 millimeters for most manufacturers is probably adequate, especially in the low demand patient. On the femur, there needs to be a wider, deeper box cut. There is a small amount of reaming, which can usually be done by hand, especially in the rheumatoid patient. Or in very soft cases, as Professor Murray just indicated, you might be able to just push it in very gently with the trial and see and get some impaction effect uh, without taking away bone. In the primary setting, they use the shortest length is usually 50 or 60 millimeters from the manufacturers and the minimum with 13 to 14. And even in a small patient, this should be okay. Uh, to review the literature, these are papers on general uh, constraint without uh, differentiating out the rheumatoid population. The first papers from my institution uh, was an early study with about five year fallowship where we showed 91% survivorship. Paul Lukevich's papers, I think we all know, have shown, shown excellent survivorship at five to 10 years. Uh, this more recent study to show that, that the percentage, I put this to show the percentage of RAs. This is just a nice study of 132 primary Zimmer LCCKs. There were only two RAs. And these were in severe valgus knees with incompetent MCLs. Uh, and he, they had a 90% survivorship at uh, uh, approaching uh, 10 years. This is the only paper that I could find uh, on specifically the constrained implant in rheumatoid arthritis, and it's in a rheumatology journal. Uh, there were 23 constrained total knees in 17 patients. Nine were revisions, so this is not all primary. The average follow-up was seven years. There was one knee with loosening, and the seven-year survivorship was 92%. This uh, case example they gave is a 25-degree valgus knee, and they used this to show the stress shielding around the femoral stem with, with cortical hypertrophy at the stem tip, which showed up at about a year and was persistent at five years, but not progressive. So you can take that for what, what it is. Um, this recent study of 85 uh, uh, stemmed constrained implants with 354 intermediate uh, constrained, they said a third were inflammatory arthritis, but they did not specify how many were RA. Uh, they did show a greater operative time when they used stems, and th their results did show uh, a support for and a favorable outcome for stems in constrained total knee. So in summary, uh, constrained implants are widely available. The indication in long-term results in primary total knee are pretty good so far, but they're still unclear and even less so in RA cases with very, very little literature to guide us. It is certainly technically more complex than a standard primary TKR, and we all vary greatly as to the threshold for going constrained. I think it's probably lower in this country and in developed countries because we see less of these severe, severe cases as you do. And we have uh, maybe less confidence in our ability to handle the severe deformities. Um, the current indications for primary total knee uh, in a constrained implant are narrow, uh, but uh, again, the severe valgus knee with an attenuated MCL. There's general agreement that the constrained total knee implant is useful. It is good for elderly and low demand patients, which RAs fit into, and the indications we talked about. And the literature overall at this point is supportive of its use. Uh, and with some early reports of increased rates of fracture, but nothing alarming at this point. So thank you again. It's wonderful to see everybody. Uh, everybody, please, please stay safe. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to see each other soon with a vaccine on the horizon. According to the, President Trump, it was supposed to be here already. So thank you, everybody. Let's see if we can. Uh -huh. Those oh, are the sweet memories.
Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I mean, I love the closing slide. I mean, uh, really brings wow. back a lot of memories, as Subhangshu said. So, well, we look forward to seeing you in the flesh, so to speak, hopefully in 21. So, uh, fingers crossed. You should have the thing under control in, in a year's time. But coming back to your talk, I mean, uh, we, in fact, I think Dr. Pachori in his uh, joint registry report said that we also have about 5 to 6% of our patients uh, undergoing arthroplasty having rheumatoid arthritis. So it's pretty similar, actually. It's, a, it's only in the same sort of range that we're looking at. But uh, obviously, the use of biologics is... Uh, been a you know a changing factor and that percentage is going to be definitely going down. But I think penetration into the rural areas is still not there. And I think uh, that's you know from the suburban and rural areas, the population, we still get a lot of uh, advanced rheumatoid patients. So uh, I open it up for everyone to ask any questions of Chris if they think that's appropriate. Sure, thank you, Dr. Roy. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So in patients with uh, rheumatoid and juvenile arthritis patients presenting with uh, fixed circulation deformity, do you uh, think there is an increased uh, chance of uh, I mean, requirement for a constraint type of processes when you're correcting the stiff uh, fixed circulation deformity, especially in juvenile rheumatoid arthritis? Uh, thank you, Dr. Danasekharan. Uh, great to see you. Uh, Sorry, we're not together in Coimbatore. Uh, it was a wonderful meeting two years ago at your uh, wonderful city. Uh, if there is a fixed flexion deformity, which without severe varus valgus, uh, which actually is not that common, usually it's accompanying one of those. Uh, again, the, 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 re the releasing to achieve full extension, and please any of the other panelists uh, add in, um, Usually, it does not disrupt too much the varus valgus stability. So I haven't found it necessary. I've been able to handle isolated severe flexion, or at least in the coronal plane, with, with, with handling of the flexion deformity, as Professor Maria had, had outlined. The posterior capsule releasing, the, the uh, um, uh, additional resection of the distal femur, et cetera. So... Uh, if in that process, the releasing becomes so extensive that the knee is destabilized, then it may be necessary. But in general, I have not, I have not personally found that to be necessary. And most of the literature reflects uh, constraint for varus valgus coronal plane deformity and not, uh, uh, sorry, there's a loud truck out my window here. There's a, and not uh, 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 sagittal plane deformity. So I find uh, in some cases where there is stiff fixed flexion deformity, where I'm not able to correct with uh, only soft tissue release, where I need to go for additional distal funnel resection, there is a high chance of uh, mid flexion instability. So I use uh, more of a constraint type of process. Any opinion from other senior faculty? Um, can I share? Yes, Pradeep. Yeah, um, I have a lot of experience on uh, flexion deformity. In fact, I'll be showing one case of bilateral 90 degree fused knee and it is impossible to correct fully on the table. But from my experience, uh, up to 30 degree of deformity, you can safely keep and you need to forcibly correct with the push knee splint. I'll show the example also. So uh, you release a lot of things and there's always some uh, gap imbalance and soft tissue laxity. So it is uh, safer to use constraint, very important. And that depends on intro of decision. So uh, if you are trying to forcibly correct, it is better you may require a link type of, I mean, rotating hinge. That may be a better option, which also gives a excellent stability in sagittal plane. So I'll share that case also in the example. So it is a decision on the table, you know, most of the time. But you need a constraint because you do a lot of release and uh, you must keep all the constraint on the table. You cannot correct full deformity if it is 90 degree or so. Safety is very important. That's again interop decision. Whatever you can correct easily, you correct. And residual in rheumatoid 
it gets corrected up to 40 degrees over a period of six weeks. We, we had discussed in, uh, you know, in one of our webinars about flexion deformity in the knee. And uh, when there is a severe flexion deformity is maybe beyond 90 degree or so, then we try to correct pre-operative, you know, serial cast correction, then do ATKR, then post-operative again cast correction. You know, gradually, it takes time, but, uh, you know, ultimately, inflammatory arthritis, they get uh, corrected. And um, Artego, if you go, you know, only during surgery, then probably then you have to put a hinge and uh, then go, go ahead with the correction. You know, I had a question for Chris, you know, Chris, uh, suppose in a medial collateral ligament, you know, the knee is a deficiency of medial collateral ligament. When, when do you decide to put a constrained knee on the table? And how far constrained? What is your assessment on the table? You know, these valgus knees and all. Um, after the, the uh, let's say the releasing is done and the correction of deformity, the bony cuts are made. Spacer block, I use the spacer block and extension. Uh, this is my training. Uh, and test the varus valgus if it is not balanced and the MCL is at the point where you don't want to continue to chase the lateral side, you'll end up with too much of a large gap in extension. Maybe that's getting to 14 to 16 uh, in that range. And you fear that it maybe gets you to an 18 or 20 gap if you keep releasing the lateral side. So if, the ten, if you get to a 12, 14 spacer, start to think of like my partner, Dr. Stuart Goodman says, they start to think about a constraint. And if it isn't balanced by 14 and it's still opening up more than two to three, definitely four millimeters on the medial side, then uh, I think we'd probably go with a constraint at that point. That's about as objective as it could make it. Uh, it's a pretty common situation, at least for the level of deformity that we see here. You know, Dr. Ranavat had a paper where he told preoperatively you take a valgus, you know, X-ray, valgus stress X-ray. If the medial opening is more than a centimeter, then uh, you have to put a constant implant for this. That was uh, one of those papers which he suggested that. Sure, I think that still holds true. Uh, it's yeah. not going to be that much after we're done with our cuts and everything. It's going to open up quite a bit intraoperatively, yes. Right, well, thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you so you. much. And uh, I think that we'll move on now to the case presentations. And the first one we've got is from Dr. Dhanashekhar Raja. And he'll be talking about this dilemma that a lot of us actually face, whether it's an infection or inflammation, and the diagnosis when the patient has an inflammatory arthritis. So over to you, Dhanashekhar. Uh, good evening, uh of the faculty and uh, viewers. So I'm presenting uh, uh, two cases. One is a uh, diagnostic dilemma in a preoperative situation, and other one is a diagnostic dilemma post-surgery. This is a 58-year-old female presenting with the pain in the right knee for the past one and a half years. It started insidiously and progressed uh, gradually. She gives a history of uh, multiple joint pain one year back, and she is hypertensive and diabetic in treatment. But she was not on, not started on any uh, rheumatoid drugs. She's taking over the counter NSAIDs for the last three months. Now she presents with the pain in the right knee, not much of warmth, but there is joint line tenderness. Movements are painful. There's minimal synovitis with uh, effusion. So these are the presenting X-rays. The right knee, left knee is uh, uh, radiologically normal except for a medial compartment arthritis. Uh, her RA factor is 20.2 units. Her cutoff is around 15. Uh, uric acid 4.9, which is uh, normal. ESR is elevated, it's 100. CRP is 61. And uh, serum creatinine is 0. 0.8. And the urea 21.8 is a diabetic, but sugars are under reasonable uh, values. So, how do we proceed now? Uh, uh, do we take this patient for surgery or is there any? Uh, Thing we, we are worried about. This is the first time a uh, patient is presenting us with uh, severe pain in the right knee. All her activities of daily living is restricted and she requires uh, some intervention. On this. Aspiration would be the first thing. Okay. 
also probably check out the urine uh, uh, culture yes urine culture is still right uh, we did that okay. any other joint involvement uh, at present no other uh, joint involvement see it gives a previous history of uh, multiple joint pains but at present only the right knee is symptomatic mm -hmm. Right. Ajit, any any questions? As of now, nothing here. But I think here probably we have to look more towards uh, subacute infection there. And like Dr. Bosle said, I think an aspiration would be the right way to uh, go ahead. Okay. So would you so would you like to do a MRI before if you are suspecting an infection? So just MRI may not be helpful. MRI with contrast study will. Uh, show enhancement if there is infection. I don't think MRI is uh, contributory in these Because cases. it's a, a rheumatoid arthritis, usually it is polyarticular mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, bilateral involvement is more common. Here we are, uh, it's slightly atypical because it's unilateral mm -hmm. and uh, uh, infection if is there in back of your mind, whereas MRI may show something, say for example, tuberculosis is always a possibility and yeah. you can see interosseous abscesses there. Yeah. So the left side shows definitely medial compartment osteoarthritis changes, not like uh, so much severe uh, changes. Left side also she has arthritis. So we can take as a bilateral involvement, uh, probably right side more than left side. Uh, ESR CRP rise, as you suggested, uh, we need to think of infection as well. So I just gave her a course of NSAIDs to see how is her response. Uh, so it, she took this course of NSAIDs for three weeks. She came back, the CRP came down to 25, ESR came down to 40. So at this situation, uh, what do you suspect? Anything else you uh, want to think about? You still go with a differential diagnosis of infection. Is she on her rheumatoid medications as well? In no, only, only NSAIDs, nothing. And uh, yeah, I, I just we take opinion from uh, Dr. Sasank. Uh, yes. Looking at this picture, uh, you know, would you recommend a patient to go ahead with the surgery or uh, would you first treat with uh, some medication then uh, tell the patient to go ahead with surgery? No, is this patient a rheumatoid patient? Anything, any other test to be done? This RA factor is enough to say it is in a no, do, do you Do you want to take the opinion of a rheumatologist in this? Yes, cases? definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, foremost, Dr. Uh, I'm asking Dr. Sasankhya. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, first and foremost, uh, whether it is monoarticular, polyarticular, even if it looks monoarticular, I would look for subtle synovitis, which is commonly there in the MCPs. Yes. One. Second, an anti CCP for sure. If the anti CCP yes. is strongly positive and the knee has been inflamed for sufficient period of time, not 15 okay. days, 20 days, one month, I would think if the anti CCP is positive, the person says knee is inflamed for six months. I won't even aspirate. I'll think in terms of straight rheumatoid. So I did an anti CCP. This is the value 22.98. Our cutoff is and 17. And how long was the knee inflamed, uh, history wise? Probably it is around three months. She's having pain uh, for almost uh, one year, but right knee has been more painful the last three months. See, if it is three weeks, maybe I'll definitely go in for an aspiration before really labeling it as five three months. months. Three months. Sorry, three months. Three months. Yes. I would yes. aspirate once. Yes. If it would have been a longer duration, I would have straight away labeled it as uh, rheumatoid. And lastly, even before taking it for surgery, uh, one would be I would definitely look for other organ involvement, interstitial lung disease. This is something that if we miss out on can be a problem. And lastly, suppose that it is confirmed that this is rheumatoid thinking in terms of surgery. I would still like to treat this with DMARDs, maybe wait for three, four months, remove all the steroids, keep only hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate, then maybe go in for surgery. Because so the pain, it's a systemic yeah. disease. The pain, is, uh, pain is there for one year, increased over three months. So one year history, the aggravation lasts three months. So there's a long duration history. Do you take this ACCP as positive or uh, what do you take this value? I, no, this is positive. This is positive. positive. For sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No doubts about that. I would go in for what your monoarticular rheumatoid. If it is okay. one year, definitely. Okay. So I didn't aspirate. I thought I will go ahead and I counsel the patient saying that it could be rheumatoid or something else also. So I didn't do MRI here. I straight away did arthrotomy. And intra I found a lot of granulation tissue, which is not typical of uh, rheumatoid. 
So I did a debridement, took multiple samples. The main suspicion was TPL site. On the TPL site, there are a lot of small, small cavities. You can see the areas of sclerosis and a lot of multiple small cavities. So I didn't go ahead with the surgery. I just put a spacer and came out and send the tissue for uh, culture, biopsy, and uh, gene expert. So mm -hmm. I put a temporary spacer, and uh, gene expert came as uh, low positive. So still our differential diagnosis were rheumatoid subacute septic arthritis at TB, and tissue culture did not grow anything. Gene expert came as a low positive and recompensin sensitive. And histopathology uh, came as a non-specific synovitis and the bone sample came as non-specific uh, osteomyelitis, synovial tissue came as acute and chronic non-specific synovitis. So I discussed with our uh, infectious disease specialist and they say any positive gene expert in extra pulmonary area should be taken as TB. So we started the patient on anti-tuberculous drugs and uh, we gave this for four weeks because I put a knee in extension I wanted to go ahead with the uh, TKR, otherwise the knee will become stiff. So we went ahead with uh, uh, repeat CRP ESR after uh, four weeks. Still the values are high. CRP was 26 and ESR for what is 46. So what should we do now? Uh, I request your opinion from all the senior faculty. Still we uh, uh, still go ahead or can I, wait? Can I share something? Tuberculosis. Yes. Tuberculosis yeah, is not a contraindication for joint replacement. So you yeah. Can, yeah. go ahead because it's an intra intracellular pathogen. It doesn't form yeah. a biofilm. Yeah. So under cover of AKT, you could still go ahead and do a joint. Would you have gone in earlier when we got the gene expert in 48 hours? Would mm -hmm. we have gone in earlier to do a TKR or you would have waited for one? I mean, it's once that you put a spacer and come out, it makes sense to wait a while, isn't it? Instead of yeah. going in too soon. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I did. I waited for one month and then started the AKT4-4 drug regime. The ESR CRP didn't come down to the value I expected, but uh, we went ahead. We did a redeployment and had to use a small TPL stem because there were a lot of uh, cavitary lesions on the TPL side. And the uh, patient uh, went on to heal well. At the end of two months, uh, still the ESR CRP is slightly high. So I would ask the, uh, want to ask the rheumatologist, uh, is this uh, CRP, ESR a concern? Uh, should we start on rheumatic drugs or should I just wait? Uh, see, as I said, in fact, nowadays we don't look at rheumatoid as rheumatoid arthritis. It's rheumatoid disease. Yeah. It's a systemic illness. And okay. since the CRP, ESR has been high, first ESR was also 100. Okay. I would definitely be looking forward to starting DMARDs. Okay. So at present, she is on uh, anti-tuberculous drugs. We will continue it for one to one half years. Uh, meanwhile, should I start her on uh, rheumatic drugs? That's what I want to do. If she is not <clears throat> symptomatic in the other joints. Um, what, what is a biopsy report? That's very yeah. important in this case. The biopsy came as non-specific synovitis and uh, non-specific uh, osteomyelitis of the bone. So did you, actually, did yeah. you actually grow uh, a, uh, um, uh, um, uh, acid fast bacilli on the bactic culture? No, uh, so far there is no growth. Uh, I think it's six or, weeks. Or then sometimes the... you can get atypical mycobacteria. So did you get any mm -hmm. of that? Yeah. But it, whatever it is, we have the positive <laughs> gene expert. That means uh, all extra pulmonary gene expert positive tissues are treated as uh, tuberculosis. So if they are responding to anti tuberculous drug, they are uh, tuberculosis. If you are suspecting uh, atypical, probably we need to add some. Yeah. Uh, like uh, levofloxacin or linozolid at this yeah, stage. Or, or, or I'm, I have a suspicion whether the CRP elevation is due to rheumatoid disease. Uh, that's what uh, my dilemma is. Atypical mycobacteria is one uh, thing, but knee is symptomatically very good. She is able to walk doing all activities of daily living. So is this CRP due to uh, inflammatory disease or uh, something else? We assume it is uh, tuberculosis and uh, probably sometime later, if she becomes symptomatic, we'll start rheumatic drugs. So this is okay with everybody? I, yes. I, have, a I have a question for Dr. Shashank. If it, is this a false uh, positive RA? Or it is said that if the RA is positive, then within two years, the progress is very uh, rapid and uh, the patient will, dis uh, the, all the other joints will get affected. So uh, we had to start inverted pyramid sort of treatment. We had to start uh, DMRD very early. So here is the contrast 
where we are not sure whether the array is falsely positive or array is positive and we have to be very aggressive at the outset so what is your opinion as regards this one uh, array can be false negative false positive it is not very specific but anti ccp is very specific it is very specific secondly anti ccp can predate the symptoms and diagnosis in a big way so even if before the <clears throat> ra actually starts there have been studies which have shown that anti ccp can predate in fact now we are looking at something called as pre ra when the ra has actually not manifested itself it is in that pre ra phase when the anti ccp is positive so one it could be patient is in the pre ra phase wherein the knee has cox the rheumatoid hasn't manifested but more practically i would still feel that this is still rheumatoid knee with that you know going by that and we still don't have i i, I understand your uh, point that all non uh, pulmonary this thing uh, gene expert has to be taken uh, seriously no doubt about it but i still feel that the ra has uh, you know actually evolved couldn't it be and, both couldn't it be both rheumatoid and possible. since there is a immunosuppression uh, so, uh, overall there is a, a immunity disorder uh, she is predisposed to have a tuberculosis uh, uh, tuberculosis in the knee so can we have the both uh, at the same time and we treat uh, akt as well as uh, we give dmrd at the same time we can give akt and dmrd at the same time see generally what we do is the first two months intensive akt phase we don't give methotrexate we give hydroxychloroquine sulfur salicin once two months are done the intensive therapy is done we can still start on methotrexate as well uh best answer is histopathology you know that absolutely. gives absolutely clarity that's a final verdict Absolutely. But uh, histopathology shows there is only you know chronic uh, inflammatory yeah. disease. Yeah, yeah. non-specific. Yeah. My my co my my question to Dr. Sasan is, what do you see in the aspiration? Uh, you told that you will aspirate that knee if the disease is within three months. What do you look for in the aspiration? One is basic. Second is TB PCR. But again, with all its plus and negative things, I mean it's not a foolproof answer. We, okay. We've got one question from the audience. Uh, is there any role of uh, PET CT in pre-op diagnosis? Dr. Rajiv Chatterjee. Yeah. It will show increased activity, so it won't show anything. Uh, I don't think it is specific for infection. It's going to show inflammation and uh, increased activity. Unless okay. you combine with some uh, infection marker, like WBC uh, labeled indium, is not going to be useful. So, Dr. Akrekar, you would suggest that this patient be started on DMRDs, right? Yes, yes, definitely. Right. Right. So, uh, this uh, there is some cross reactivity of uh, uh, this gold uh, gold uh, interferon test with uh, anti CCP positive patients, but now the government has banned uh, the interferon for TB. So, we go only by uh, uh, this uh, gene expert. So previously we used to do quantiferon uh, test for TB, and this cross reacts with uh, anti CCP, and 13% false positivity is present. Okay, and uh, should I go ahead with one more case, or uh, should I stop? No, I think we'll we'll move on to Bini. If, if that's okay, and if you have the time, we'll come back to you, Dhana. Sure, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and. Uh, after that, I think we'll move on to Dr. Budhadev Chatterjee, and he's going to be talking about a patient with hip and knee involvement in RA. So, Buddha, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back. So uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity. And I must say, it's been a wonderful evening. It's great to be amongst all, all of you. Uh, so this, is, this case is uh, about a situation which we face fairly commonly, where a patient has multiple joint involvements. And uh, they may have a simultaneous uh, hip and knee involvements in that uh, we need um, a, a bit of extra planning and special care. So this case is a 62-year-old lady, long-standing rheumatoid on irregular treatment and was almost bedridden since one year with very limited ambulation, severe pain in both hips and knees, uh, presently off DMRDs, but on, only on painkillers. And uh, fortunately, she didn't have very significant uh, 
comorbidities. So on examining the hips, there was a flexion deformity of about 30 degrees on both sides, limitation of abduction, there's complete absence of rotations. Flexion was possible till 90 degrees. Uh, there were no less discrepancies, particularly supratrochanteric uh, shortings, and there was no instability. And the knee, there was a severe valgus in both knees, about 30 degrees on one side, 45 on the left, about 20 degrees of flexion deformity, both knees, the valgus was, importantly, the valgus was not passively correctable. Uh, further flexion was possible till 90 degrees. There was no instability and no distal deficits. So this is the picture of the patient. Uh, if you want me to carry on or to stop at any given time, just let me know. I think you can carry on. So the x-rays, no? Yeah, okay. So this is the x-ray of the hip. Uh, bilateral involvement with significant protrusio. And uh, this is the AP view of the knees, uh, which shows a contained defect on the tibia. <coughs> and these are the lateral views. So uh, this, these were the questions which were facing us, whether to, uh, which joint to do first, I think which, which Dr. Maria uh, very uh, nicely took out in his uh, talk. Uh, so do we do a single stage ipsilateral THR and TKR? Uh, that's what we decided to do. Uh, mainly because I think he also brought out an important point that when there is a significant valgus deformity, then it's better to do the knee and the hip at the same time. If you leave the, if, the, if you just do the hips and let, let the patient walk, then they are at an increased risk for dislocation. Uh, however, we spaced out the surgeries from on the right and left side by about two weeks to allow uh, medical recovery to happen. Uh, and the operative findings in the hip, quite expectedly, there was severe osteoporosis, soft tissue fibrosis and contractures. Uh, there was significant protrusio with a rim defect uh, in the in the acetabulum, uh, and there was a, a fairly patulous wide uh, medullary canal. Um, this was the uh, approach that we undertook. We uh, I did a posterior approach because that's what uh, I'm used to. Uh, significant soft tissue releases. It required a tenotomy of the TFL and sartorius at the anterior superior iliac spine level to correct the flexion deformity, apart from the capsular uh, stripping. Uh, a lot of care had to be exercised while dislocating the hip, firstly because of the protrusio, and secondly, because of the osteoporosis. So it is the hip is always at a risk for fracture. Uh, acetabular re reconstruction was required using impaction bone grafting and a tantalum mesh for the rim defect. And uh, we used cemented implants because of the osteoporosis, it was difficult to uh, jam a non cemented uh, hip in this. So, uh, this is the uh, picture that Stabula can see. The, uh, can appreciate the protrusio. Uh, this is a tantalum mesh posterior superiorly to just uh, cover the rib defect. And this cavity was filled with uh, chips uh, of uh, bone chips and finally uh, from the head, of course. And this is the uh, cemented acetabulum in place. Uh, and as far as the knee was concerned, the valgus was fairly rigid. Uh, the flexion deformity of uh, 20 degrees was partially correctable. Uh, the, there were severe contractures of the IT band, the LCL, popliteus, posterior cap, posterior lateral corner, and the biceps, hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle, a contained defect in the lateral tibial condyle, and osteoporosis, uh, just as in the hip. So I use a lateral approach here because it needed a, fair, a fairly extensive lateral soft tissue release. Normally, of course, I still prefer the medial approach. Uh, the patella para fat was very important here because if that is removed, then you can almost feel the implant just under the skin. So this had to be preserved. There's a co conservative tibial resection as is recommended in valgus cases. Minimal resection of the femoral condyle on the lateral side. Uh, sometimes you may actually need to build it up, but here we just managed to shave off a, a couple of millimeters. Uh, posterior fem femoral cut was made parallel to the tibial cut. You cannot use the posterior uh, condyle because of the hypoplasia on the lateral side. So this is so we made the posterior femoral cut parallel to the tibia. Uh, you have to take care of the lateral popliteal nerve because very often you can end up, especially when there's a flexion deformity, you can end up with a, a, a foot drop post-operatively. 
the interline interoperative alignment was checked with an X-ray, or you could also use uh, navigation uh, just to be sure. And of course, as was uh, as as was uh, pointed out in the previous talks, always keep constraint available. So this was the uh, the valgus before starting lateral approach. Uh, this is the extensive uh, soft tissue release on the lateral side. We stripped mm -hmm. off the IT band. And uh, this was uh, the, the, uh, the intraoperative X-ray, or you can use the, the, uh, the CAS uh, uh, if possible. This is the post-operative X-ray of the hip. Post-operative X-ray of the knee. The constraint was required to sort of compensate for medial collateral laxity. Uh, this is the, lat these are the lateral views. So in summary, if the lateral and bilateral hip and knee involvement is not uncommon in long-standing poorly treated rheumatoids, these patients are extremely disabled and they require fairly extensive surgery to restore activities of daily living. Careful planning of the procedures are required and is dictated by the relative ext extent of involvement and degree of deformity. For instance, if there is a significant valgus in the knee, then the hips and the knees both should be done at the same time. Generally, however, the hip should be corrected first. An effective strategy is to combine ipsilateral hip and knee correction in the same sitting. Difficulties encountered at surgery include severe soft tissue fibrosis and fragile bone. Uh, and very importantly, I think these patients are long suffering and one must be mindful of severe medical comorbidity, particularly immunosuppression leading to infection and interstitial lung disease, which can cause uh, severe morbidity after surgery. I thank you for a patient hearing and wish you all a very happy Navaratri in advance. Thank you, Vidhi. Thank you so much. I mean, that was a difficult case and it's extremely well handled. I'd just I'd like to ask the faculty, would anyone else have done anything differently or would everyone have followed uh, the route that Vidhi's taken? I think not everybody has CA CAS. <laughs> start with <laughs> uh, you know it's the same uh, i think uh, screen please the principle is that uh, you correct the proximal joints first before going to our distal joints but again it depends on the positioning of the patient uh, if uh, there are not much of movements there in the hip uh, the, then uh, if for doing a knee you have to flex the hip if the hip is you know if you can flex the hip then you can go ahead doing the knee. So it depends, varies from patient to patient. In this particular patient, BD went and I didn't doing uh, that way, but uh, it, every patient, the decision will vary depending upon the deformity, the range of movements. And uh, uh, of course, the patient also, you have to take the patient into confidence. Which joint is more painful? Patient would like to do that joint first. So uh, case to case, so, uh, the decision varies. As Dr. Maria pointed out, a lot of the knee pain is actually coming from the hip itself. So I think uh, proximal to distance uh, with uh, ipsilateral involvement always makes sense, to be very honest. Yeah. Here, here I have, the, yeah. I have a question there. Yes. Dr. Buddha and Dr. Maria also. Uh, whenever you are not using the navigation and we have done the hip first, then what is the distal femoral cut angle that you would take? Because you do not know, know the uh, HKA angle. So in absence of navigation, how much distal femoral cut would you take? When the hip is done, uh, you would not know the uh, angle there. Well, you are not using is, gas. Yeah, it so, depends. First thing is, it depends if you are dealing with a valgus knee. Or are you dealing with a knee which is rheumatoid but is not damaged uh, in a valgus direction? If it is valgus, then you come down about two to three degrees less, maybe four degrees uh, valgus when you're dealing with it. Or And if you other, which is theoretically defined but rarely used as you measure the angle on the other side. Sir, I'm talking, the, uh, I'm talking about the, I am talking about a case where the hip is done now. It is not a native yeah. hip, but hip is done. Now the offset yeah. is decided by the prosthesis of the hip. Yes. So HK so, angle is changed now because of the hip prosthesis proximally. Agreed. But you, you have a range. You have a range between 5 to 7. If you have a valgar uh, angle down below, you can take it at 5 or 4. And if it is a normal one, you can take it 6. That doesn't matter. 
it's not going to make a huge difference with one or two degrees like this and since both the joints are being changed it works very well okay. i would also yeah. like to just make one little observation uh, which i felt that with a knee like this, which is involved and with a protrusion in the hip i would recommend or at least i would do an osteotomy in situ and then remove the head then try to remove the head from from the deep socket because yeah. it, it uh, physically is very dangerous in an osteoarthritic i could actually trim off the rim of the of posterior superior part of the acetabulum to deliver the head but in rheumatoid i'd like to maintain the whole socket as much as i can and fill the depth with graft which is re recovered from the head so therefore it's a good idea to cut it off and then take it out with a, a cork screw or something and yeah, that, not that that is exactly what we did actually we did a neck osteotomy and then remove the head uh, after that because uh, yeah because it it was quite uh, you know locked inside with with respect to dr mohan desai's question i would like to have uh, chris uh, what is your opinion regarding that uh these cases are not commonly seen here i uh, these are wonderful seeing this and it brings to mind a paper of professor lu ho shan i think who we all know in in china who wrote up a series uh, we wrote up a series with him about 20 years ago of a hip a lateral hip and knee and one of the the stronger indications for doing that in one sitting is the is the severe severe flexion contracture i think which pradeep is going to show us a case right now because with a knee stuck at 90 degrees there's there's to, you can't deal with either of them so certainly the hip is easier to deal with the knee stuck at 90 degrees and vice versa so um dr chatterjee i just was looking at your wonderful x-rays of that result Thank you. Is that a is that a intermediate constrained insert or a fully constrained implant with a deeper femoral box? So this is this is uh, the TC3 equivalent of the LCCK of Zimmer. So the reason I had to use a constraint is because uh, the medial uh, collateral was fairly lax, and uh, I didn't want to take a chance there. So that's why I used the constraint in this. Uh, one question: uh, yes. When you use a constraint. Yeah. Um, do you think that you should have a stem with it? Yes, uh, I knew you'd ask that. <laughs> that is, uh, yeah. But if you read the papers, you know, of late, the, the more recently they are tending to move away from stems. It's not absolutely mandatory to use smaller a stem. stems. Or yeah, or, or it's not mandatory to use a stem. See, we are now talking about zones of fixation. So if you yeah, have a yeah. zone one and zone two good fixation uh, without uh, too much of bone defect. residual bone defect and you are cementing in the keel very well so i people are moving away from stems but i mean okay. you can use a stem of course particularly on the tibial side yeah see so just i want to say here yeah. here right. you, if you if you once you put the patient laterally then it is it's fairly reasonably mm -hmm. uh, easy to do the hip because you if you if, even if your knee is fixed in flexion and valgus you can still do the hip once you've done the hip then you've corrected the flexion deformity at the hip then you can tackle the knee all yeah. you need to do is to turn turn the patient over and redrape uh which i thought we are uh, because uh, in such situation the other option of doing both the hips together and then the knees separately i think would have been uh, more problematic great right before we go on to pradeep's case there's a comment from dr gurinder bedi in delhi and oh, he hello, says that hello, yeah Hi, Gurinder. I mean, basically, he says that uh, in Dr. Dhanushekaraja's case, she needs operative intervention, highly unlikely to be pyogenic with a range of motion of 110 degrees. Even if suspicious of TB, intraop, intraop, proceed for TKR, and in rheumatoid, also proceed. So he's basically saying that why use a spacer at all? Dhana, any anything to yeah. say in yeah, defense? But, uh... yeah but uh, even with a low grade septic arthritis you don't have a very stiff knee they have a reasonable range of movement so range of movement is not the only criteria what we see in trop the quality of tissues always uh, you need to be suspicious of uh, low grade septic arthritis tb yeah. and rheumatoid are fine i'm only worried about uh, low grade septic arthritis so i always take a uh, cautious approach when i deal with this uh, dubious situations i i fully agree with danish because uh, any time there is a doubt always uh, use a spacer that's a better option definitely would would, would you like to do pre op uh, 
three two or three aspirates before you actually proceed if the ASR remains high. The inflammatory markers uh, in uh, um, inflammatory arthritis as well as uh, osteoarthritis or any native joints are all similar. So that are supposed to be come in the next case, but the reports show that there is no major difference between inflammatory arthritis joints and the native joints or the post uh, prosthetic joints. The, maybe the cutoff is slightly higher, statistically no difference. Even if you aspirate, it will come as rheumatoid. You are not sure whether it's infection or not. Well, Dhana, if we have the time, we'll get back to you. Yeah, sure. Right, Pr Pradeep. So it's over to you and you will be talking about stiff knee and arthritis and how to avoid complications during surgery. Yeah. All yours. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful meeting and uh, it's nice to be with the group. Uh, stiff knee is very common in rheumatoid and over a period of time, uh, even you, it proceeds to ankylosis. So ankylosis is a final uh, uh, part of the end of the rheumatoid disease. So uh, stiffness, there are a lot of definition of stiffness. But most common is less than 50 degrees uh, labeled as stiffness. And bony ankylosis means no mobility. Now, it can be extension or inflection. And the management definitely is different. Because in extension, there's a quadricep is tight. So all the exposure, everything needs to release that to achieve flexion. While in flexion, ankylosis or stiffness, Hamstrings and posterior capsules are tight. So you have to concentrate more. Hamstrings are not tight. Quadriceps are not tight in flexion deformity. So as you know, all the factors associated with the rheumatoid is osteoporosis, soft tissue contracture, deformity, high incidence of infection. So this is a case of bilateral uh, knee ankylosis. So it's the ultimate stage of stiffness. 61-year-old female bedridden for one year, burnt out rheumatoid arthritis, a bilateral THA 15 years, a bilateral protrusion on both the side, right is more painful, painless knee fusion in extension as shown in the diagram, a stiff a jog of mobility in the spine, and these are the parameters, CRP is 1.4, ESR 31, RA positive, hand is also involved as usual. So this was a case, sound, I mean, uh, solid ankylosis, bony ankylosis, both the side, osteopenia. And this was a hip x-ray, there's a protrusio. And this was painful. So we did hip first, followed by knee. So these were the problem, exposure, as you know, as I told you, in extension, you have to be very careful. You have to manage the extensor compartment. Uh, patella is also usually fused. Patella is also usually fused. So you need osteotomy of the patella, then tibiofemular osteotomy. And most important thing is you must achieve at least 90 degree of flexion for good implantation of the TKR. You have to forward retract the TBR Ransal manual clearance of the tibia and femur, bone cuts, soft tissue balance, and selection of constraint depends intraoperatively. So it's very important, rheumatoid, you have to be very careful and you have to do with the trial and you have to keep all types of constraint available for you. And then implantation, check the stability. So these are the problems, uh, inadequate exposure, patellar tendon, avulsion, intraoperative fracture, Difficulty balancing flexion extension gap, component malpositioning, extensor mechanism alignment because rheumatoid, it is a valgus and there's a lot of problem with the lateral tightness need to release and balance the quadricep mechanism, avoid maltracking of the patella and many times this avulsion, the soft tissues are very friable, you have to be careful and so extended knee exposure now, the first and most important thing in a stiff knee is a very commonly used quadriceps snip. It was uh, described by Insal 1993 for stiff knee. 
and this is exactly how it is done at the end of the rectus tendon you take a 45 degree angulation towards the vastus lateralis and you can rip the flap completely and you can bend the knee progressively after clearing the quadricep uh, from both the sides and this is how it is done and this is a, you can close it and there is hardly any special precaution you can have a normal protocol of precaution that has been uh, described by many people so you don't need any special uh, precaution you can mobilize like a normal tkr sometimes still it is not possible to bend the knee after osteotomy you need a extensile approach especially in extension stiff extension deformity and there are two ways one is a tibial tuberosity osteotomy tto and by plasty turn down now these are the two option now the disadvantage of the by plasty it was described in 1943 for kunz and adam one biggest disadvantage is a uh, laxit you get a lag quadricep lag and so that is a big problem while tto uh, you don't get lag but there are problems with the non union avulsion lot of other factors so both has got problem but if you succeed in tto they you don't get lag so i my preference is tto most of the patient i prefer tto you have to be very careful uh, about 1 cm thick and about 8 to 10 cm long a uh, flap so the show the case please yeah yeah i'll just same uh, patient i have done this yeah mm -hmm. so uh, and you can close it nicely that's the same case i'm just showing and patella you have to be very careful uh, you expose superiorly medially and just do osteotomy and open the you have to be very careful go on the side and cut the tibia femoral osteotomy to achieve this 90 degree flexion and this is a post op x ray 2012 and very important after doing tto you must check the stability so that you can mobilize the joint post operatively so this is ultimate important test to see that your osteotomy is stable and this is 9 8 years post op everything is beautifully united and joined with we use lcck and it was quite good and this is a 8 year follow up we did a hip first and reconstructed with the and this is a patient 8 year follow up rheumatoid they have multiple problems and their activity is very poor and uh, but she's got a useful uh, function at the eight, end of 8 years so this is one more just uh, one slide uh, flexion on both the side and you cannot do pre operative traction or wedging it's a bony ankylos medullary canal is also well connected and uh, there's a remodeling of the posterior canal and this is a splint 30 degree of flexion post op was there and this is a push knee splint and you can see complete correction over four weeks and uh, we use we had to use uh, rhk because there was a flexion extension and a lot of other laxity and this is a nine year follow up with excellent function this was one just to show the last case uh, this was a stiff knee and physiotherapists were trying to give little extra mobilization and they created a fracture and we use only ps knee and this is at the end of almost 8 uh, to 9 years complete cons consolidation remodeling and fine thank you very much thanks great cases uh, pradeep uh, uh, question from the dr rajput and he is basically wants to know yeah that how do you decide in which case to use a quadriceps snip and when to use a tto what okay. would be your uh, criteria yeah very good question because uh, everybody should be familiarized with uh, step by step so initial safe 
approach is uh, quadriceps nip. Very simple, and you do it, and you try releasing from all the side, and try to bend. You should achieve ninety degree of flexion. So if you achieve safely, then it's fine. But if you can't achieve, you have to do either TTO or vastus uh, flap vivaplasty. So I'm more for TTO, but some people prefer a vivaplasty. So these are the two options available. If you can't achieve 90 degree flexion in stiff knee with quadriceps tightness, now so quadriceps tightness is mainly in extension deformity. So my question is, yeah, uh, sir, you have done a quadriceps snip and you find that it is uh, not giving you adequate exposure. Can you combine that proximal uh, polar exactly. and no, sir? Can we combine sir with TTO as well as quadriceps uh, uh, snip? Can we combine both? Yes. So okay. in this case, fuse extension knee. I've shown that I've combined both. Okay. So okay. first stage you do snip. If you are not able to succeed. even after releasing quadriceps from femur and laterally you can safely do tto but you have to be very very careful bone is very uh, soft and uh, uh, i don't use tourniquet so everything sh should be under your control and time is very important to uh, do carefully because many time if you are under tourniquet you are in hurry so that is one point that you have enough time to take your decision If you are not under tourniquet, uh, Chris, Pradeep, Chris, uh, what is yeah. your opinion about uh, this? Uh, uh, do you do, you know, quadriceps snip and uh, TTO um, in the same year that you are? Uh, yeah, this opinion? case, this case bilateral, I have done the same. I require TTO. How many TTO. cases have you done? How I have done about twelve cases of TTO with uh, uh, snip, fuse knee. In I exchange. think that should work. any of the faculty done this combination before anyone else so i think generally there's a, the the consensus is that you should not combine proximal and distal procedures in the same thing. exactly i mean uh, yeah. dr maria you got something could you unmute yourself please yes yeah, i i i'll tell you yes we have done it but only in two cases the only thing one has to remember is there is no problem i see no problem in doing that just because it's at two ends why because both get sufficient time to heal and both are sufficiently stable but but when you are closing them the uh, vy the not the vy the quadriceps snips has to be closed first in the knee in extension and then with the knee in flexion you bring the osteotomy to its position and then you put the wires on it that stable enough at the bottom and this heals on its own there is there's no issue with that i will concur with that yeah and one very important thing is uh, after closing uh you must check the stability which i showed the video so that was actual case where i have done both and i don't think there is any problem literature also supports when you need to expose there is no other option either vivaplasty or tto uh pradeep have you tried the uh, ranavat's technique of pie crusting the uh, uh, the rectus tendon yes but pie crusting you are again you are not able to freely expose so i'm more happy with this pie crusting is when there's a residual tightness if there's a then you can do pie crusting but with this you get a fantastic exposure whatever you want to do you can do it safely pie crusting it is half hearted procedure so if there's Sir, a residual tightness you don't get a flexion then you do pie crusting after doing your tkr so okay. if you Sir, doctor, doctor 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 avina has a question Uh, sir, uh, is is your post op rehab prot protocol different when you have done both of them together as compared to if you are doing either one of the two? Uh, of course, uh, TTO you have to guard with a, a knee splint for at least six weeks. Weight bearing is fine with full extension, but uh, mobilization has to be guarded. You can't do a pre mobilization, but supervised you can see progressively uh, they uh, get up to sixty, eighty, and supervised. otherwise uh, they must get a hinge knee brace and they walk with that so don't allow free mobilization without brace so that part is very important here i had done both side tto and absolutely so far in 12 cases uh, i have had no problem no did you fix the fragment slightly in a superior position and then yeah. excise that bit of bone or something uh 
exactly it is required in one or two cases when there is a patella baha you yeah. can take it little up so you do get little extra movement that patella baha part can be compensated slightly 2 3 mm not much can i ask a little more difficult please question? Please, please from a learner's point of view at least see totally ankylosed knee no landmarks there how do you assess your joint line and how do you get your cuts and more important how do you get your release to get the knee into extension tibial tibial osteotomy i'm sure many of us has done that and more comfortable with that this yeah. is a more challenging problem i think okay now uh, see uh, the bilateral flex knee was a more challenging because it was 11 years and there was a complete consolidation of the medullary canal continuity so but if you open it and go superiorly you do see some flare of the femur and you can imagine where the joint so 2 3 mm or 4 mm of change when you are using a constraint will not make significant difference so it nobody can be absolutely accurate but you do get some plane you can imagine how the flare of the condyle flare of the tibia tibial tuberosity patella and uh, you have some pre operative uh, planning vision also so roughly you get idea any time if you have problem you can take a cm vision and you can after sure release right yeah. well thank you doc, uh, dr pradeep i mean that was a great uh, case and good discussion uh could we move on to dr desai's uh, presentation and he'll be showing us something that most of us have read about but haven't really had too many chances to do the kebelish approach to the knee dr desai it's all yeah. yours yeah thanks i thanks dr mohanty uh, the kebelish uh, approach or uh, anterolateral approach i think dr buddha has already uh, shown that but i will just uh, say show you a video uh, uh kebelish way back in 1991 described this corr and then bukel also uh, uh, did it and there are advantages of this there are no separate releases for the valgus exposure is a part of the release itself patellar vascularity is preserved it eliminates the patellar maltracking it improves the tilt many times a less constrained implant can be used it has a shorter operative time as per the meta analysis and uh, uh, review articles and it has a better alignment uh, it is good for uh, type 2 and type 3 ranavat that is the moderate and severe degree of ranavat and rigid deformities and craco type 2 where the mcl is stretched is an example where there is a rigid valgus it is uh, partly correctable and uh, we did uh, it required most of uh, the things which is required for the uh, uh, for the valgus so uh, this was the uh, position uh, we take the uh, lateral approach anterior lateral approach and we work the same way as we would do it uh, on the varus knee on the medial side so we excise the uh, meniscus we uh, erase the uh, a uh, work around the lateral corner erase the it band that is a part of the exposure and we internal rotate to enter uh, you know uh, sort of subluxate the tibia and that's the exposure that you would get it uh, and then you would do most of your uh, things as you would do it uh, as you approach from the medial side uh, you use the uh, the tibial cut sometimes if it's difficult you can combine it with the quadriceps snip or tto but many times it is not required we can do the femoral cut first so as to give uh, uh, the year there is hardly any uh, femoral cut because it was a valgus or distal femoral distal lateral femoral cut you can see that the jig is standing uh, away from the distal lateral portion the rotation is far better when you do this uh, uh, from this approach you can see it is standing out we have a uh, rotation insoles uh, boot and uh, this re did require a uh, popliteal and uh, lateral release in the form of uh, lateral condylar osteotomy there you can see this was a defect which was uh, managed with the screws and the uh, cement there this was possible inflection then we we did a lateral condylar osteotomy before we did this we do a separate sort of incision which can be controversial but we do a peroneal nerve decompression through a separate incision you can evert the patella if you want to do it 
only in extension and that's the trial so we uh, put in screws there to build up the cement or screws with the cement to build up the defect on the distal lateral uh, condyle and after you have put in the processes let the lateral condyle condylar osteotomy recede distally and uh, anteriorly and then you fix it that's the small incision on the lateral side for peroneal nerve decompression this was the pre op this was a pre op this was the post op scanogram almost 27 degrees of valgus run over type 3 and that's the post op that's the healing at one year that's the one year healing at one year uh, so uh, you can do it uh, another case post tuberculous arthritis with flexion deformity and fixed valgus uh, the uh, from almost 45 degree this is under anesthesia under anesthesia also it was not correcting it the she had full flexion to around 45 degree of uh, uh, flexion deformity along with the valgus and uh, here we did a cablish approach and we could manage with the uh, deep dish implant there rather than doing any constraint or uh, you know constraint implant there and we managed we could uh, manage that with the uh, so a small clip there we did it we kept a knee in flexion initially to decrease without tourniquet we kept the knee in flexion so as to reduce the bleeding and then at the time of patellar dissection there were a lot of fibrosis in the supra patellar pouch post uh, tuberculosis uh, uh, which we had to excise and do and then we could get the exposure to the joint so that's the standard orthotomy on the lateral side now here so after correction of this once you put in a uh, prosthesis you will leave with when you are dissecting you leave a fat pad there and uh, along with the lateral side infra patellar fat pad which you can suture it because when you cor correct the deformity there will be a small defect there in the retinaculum which you can suture it or there are techniques where these have uh, they have described a deep fascia flap uh, in the coronal sort of a z plasty but we keep a synovial fat pad here there was lot of fibrosis so we couldn't get much of a fat now we are working on the lateral side we use the cautery there there was so this i am releasing the it band from the gurdis tubercle and as you work there you internally rotate the tibia gradually many times uh, the patellar dislocation is not possible uh, the, the you have to subluxate the tibia patellar eversion is not possible you have to subluxate the tibia here in this case you can see the, the cartilage was totally gone there was a, a lot of fibrosis which i had to excise and uh, to prevent the patellar tendon from avulsing and as a reminder to the assistant we put in a pin there uh, in the tibial tuberosity it may not have much effect but it, it may uh, give you a sort of a reminder that you have to take care of the patellar tendon so and after you do that the exposure is just like as you would do it uh from the medial side so you are you don't have to do separate efforts or separate uh, uh releases because during the exposure the release of the lateral structures especially the it band is done you go around the corner to the posterior lateral uh, capsule okay so and uh, you can get this sort of uh, exposure there and you can do the bone preparation and that was the post op uh, x ray there so there are uh, sequence of releases in sol and uh, described the release when you do a medial approach it's a posterolateral corner first 
uh, Ranavat did it uh, first where uh, IT band pie crusting, but here Cablish and Bluekale who use the latter approach, the IT band release is a part of the exposure and that is uh, automatically done when, once you are exposing the knee. You can see the uh, small gap, which you can have it when you are correcting a virus also. Uh, when you uh, uh, correct a virus deformity into valgus, there will be a small gap there, but this gap can be filled with the uh, infrapatellar fat pad there. You keep it and keep it along with this lateral flap and you can suture that. So small gap, gap will be there. Uh, not much to show here. So that's the that's at the time of closure. Here there is a lot of fibrosis, not much of a flap there, but you could manage to close that uh, lateral defect well. And the patellar tracking is pristine. Uh, unlike uh, you have uh, uh, the medial approach, especially in the valgus knees where the patella is uh, totally dislocated, this approach is, uh, approach is uh, quite an advantage. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. Uh, it's rather like trying to drive a car on the other side of the road. I mean, I think uh, because you're sort of used to driving on one side and everything looks completely different. How many of these cases have you done? So I, 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 I have uh, any valgus, I do it. Uh, even in the mild cases, I do it from the lateral side. Uh, usually, it is an advantage to do it in the uh, moderate and severe cases. But when you do it, uh, the simpler cases for uh, mild valgus, you get uh, used to it. So I do all my valgus knees from uh, anterolateral approaches. Chris, do you have any uh, idea? Have you had any experience with this lateral approach? Uh, thank you, uh, Ronan. I've done it a few times for the valgus knee. Uh, and my concern with it has been how far Closer. up proximally and into uh, area of the cardio tendinous junction you're not used to. As in the medial side, you can really go up quite a far away and have a tendon to tendon repair. I uh, learned this from Professor Lo Nainan in Singapore, um, who had done uh, who had done this in his, uh, done this with him in a cadaver lab, as well as watched him operate. So it is a useful approach. Our deformities are not so severe in the deform in, in the uh, developed country, so the lead, the need for a direct lateral approach in total knee is is not so often for us. We can usually address all of our valgus deformities through medial therapy, standard medial therapy. If you could just be a bit louder, sir. Uh, yeah. Sorry. If you so I, I do all my uh, moderate and severe valgus through a lateral parapetular approach and a correctable valgus through a medial approach. So, so once you do that, you are, once you become familiar and uh, helps in severe valgus deformity. Uh, coming to the uh, open peroneal release, uh, uh, which cases you do this open release, Dr. Uh, Mohan? I would do it uh, in the fixed rigid uh, deformities. Flexible deformity is not required because the peroneal nerve is not at stretch. But it's quite controversial. But uh, Buchel uh, way back uh, advised that. And uh, it's a very small separate incision posterolateral. Few would do it. Buchel advised it uh, by, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, morselizing the, femur, uh, the fibular head from within the incision. So that is part of a sort of an indirect release of the peroneal. So many people do it in a different way. So I take a small incision uh, separately, posterior lateral, and release it, uh, which uh, uh, with uh, at least five to seven centimeters of uh, difference between uh, these two incisions. So distally, you release the uh, just at the fibular neck, just at the fibular uh, neck, just yeah. at the fibular neck where it is tethered. So it's a, it's a very small incision with adequate uh, gap between the sc uh, two skin incisions. Was it, uh, was, it, uh, was it effective in uh, reducing the incidence of uh, peroneal nerve palsy? Yes, 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 certainly. But I do not know whether it was because of that, but uh, uh, in these cases, we did not have any. Uh, because I, I, do, I do not pertain, uh, attribute it to that, but uh, I feel safety, sort of, by doing it uh, before, uh, before uh, stretching the nerve. Yeah, Mohanji, it's a wonderful approach. Only one small uh, uh, the closure sometimes, the is a little difficult. You cannot close the retinaculum and the implant sometimes may be uh, 
little subcutaneous sometimes when the patient is thin. So how do you cover that, the covering of the implant? So the, in a severe virus, uh, when you uh, correct it into usual valgus, you have the similar defect uh, on the medial side uh, distally. So you, we managed to do that. Here, uh, what has been described, we put in an infrapatellar sinoval fat pad. And while you're taking an incision, you keep it with the lateral uh, flap. And that you suture it so that there is a closure. So when we are exposing, when you're coming down, when, whenever lower, you are exposing. Yeah, lower pole of fetla, you change the blade horizontally. That's right. Take the entire flat flap with the lateral flap and we can right. close it. And uh, in some cases where we do resection of the tumor, we use that uh, mesh, the hernia mesh to close the joint and we can score the skin over it, but sometimes there can be skin necrosis. I use this technique on some occasions. Right, Dr. Badia, any comments? I personally have been quite comfortable doing it with my usual uh, this thing. And I did try it uh, on an occasion and I didn't really find it too comfortable. So I guess I did not do enough of it to say that I am uh, doing a great job with that. So, and I could do most of my work with the ones that I'm doing. So I, I have no real uh, observation on that. No personal experience. I'm on the same thing with you, sir. Yeah. But I think Mohanji is okay, doing a wonderful any, job. Any yeah. Mohanji is doing a wonderful job. And we must encourage him to continue it. Uh, absolutely. Always is a challenging <laughs> job. Uh, there, there are so many ways to skin a cat. And you just need to keep doing it again and again. Yes. And, and the other advantage of doing a lateral epicondylar osteotomy, the use of constrained implant has come down dramatic, uh, dramatically. So almost uh, I have not used a constrained implant for a long time. Unless yeah, there is a MCL laxity where we go for a hinge. I have not used a constrained implant. Yeah, I have sufficient uh, experience with the lateral epicondylar osteotomy. After the first one, Dr. Briad had come and demonstrated it to us in my OT. And then I found that to be a very comforting uh, procedure. But, the, the, but then that doesn't mean you have to go from the lateral side. You can do the medial side and then do that separately. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. If you have a petlar, lateral petlar subluxation, type 3 petlar, then this lateral approach is an additional advantage. Otherwise, we can still do the medial approach. I agree with you. Yes, it's convincing. It's a convincing argument. But I guess uh, you got to get the courage to keep doing it again and again. But what I really liked was that uh, observation that start with the easier ones and then make it a habit. But what happens is usually people like me, they try to do the difficult one because the other ones they do anyway easily. So uh, that perhaps is the problem. We have gone the right learning curve. Fantastic, yeah. Mohanji. So, I think, uh, uh, quickly, we can uh, go through Dr. Dhan's case. Your last case, we give you 10 minutes to wrap up. Okay, so sure. that's all you've got. Okay, sure, sir. So, uh, we are going to discuss about uh, problems with uh, patients with the uh, uh, inflammatory arthritis. This is a 65 year old female, one year post TKR on rheumatoid drugs, presenting with pain and effusion in the knee. ESR CRP is slightly elevated. So, how do we proceed with this patient? Uh, do we follow the uh, usual criteria of uh, aspiration? Uh, yeah. So, aspiration is it anything different from uh, routine joints or is uh, are there any set criteria for this? Do you still go with the same ESR, CRP, Sanival cell count? What are the cutoff for uh, blood CRP, ESR? What are the cutoff for synovial uh, WBC and CRP? 6,500 in a chronic case. 6,500 and uh, more than perhaps 65 polymorphs in the, uh, in the synovial fluid. 65%. Is, there any, is there any difference in clinical signs and symptoms? Uh, do you take uh, clinically there it won't there won't be any uh, difference it's a chronic uh, sort of uh, infection it may be a low grade infection so clinically difficult to differentiate but synovial uh, synovial uh, aspiration perhaps uh, leukocyte esterase uh, test and uh, the cultures would help you so they say you go case by case whatever be the joint infection that is a general dictum of any prosthetic joint infection go case by case Sometimes if there's a very low virulent organism, which can happen in rheumatoid, there cannot be specific clinical signs. 
but do look for uh, wound warmth knee warmth redness and swelling if you come to the uh, synovial uh, esr crp not uh, not major difference from uh, routine patients and uh, say diagnostic criteria for uh, rheumatoid there may be a slight elevation but generally there is no major difference and uh, this is a level one study from uh, cipriano they compared 871 consecutive hip and knee arthroplasties of which 61 were uh, inflammatory arthritis 810 were uh, non inflammatory arthritis their cut off for infection and non infection group was almost similar if you take esr non inflammatory arthritis 32 inflammatory arthritis 30 crp 15 and 17 synovial blood cell count 3500 in non inflammatory arthritis and same in inflammatory arthritis the differential count non inflammatory 78% and inflammatory 75% so they showed no major difference and the uh, con- most common infection in this group was staph species staphylococcus compared to uh, non inflammatory arthritis more of staph aureus and these are the uh, multiple papers comparing uh, inflammatory with non inflammatory uh, uh, some papers show that the threshold is slightly higher but this study level one study shows there no major difference so the cut off is almost same you should take the same criteria as a non inflammatory patient so synovial cell blood count interleukin 6 crp appear to be slightly higher but they overlap with that of a non infected patient so we need to uh, follow the same criteria coming to management is there a role for debridement and prosthetic retention do you think in rheumatoid patient is there a role or is there is it a contraindication so uh, this paper from uh, parvesi gives some guidelines open debridement and implant retention uh, 17 articles were reviewed 525 cases success rate is around 14 to 83% overall success rate was 48% in the series in rheumatoid it is 32% maybe marginally less so there is no contraindication we can still do a uh, debridement and prosthetic retention uh, do we do a single stage or two stage uh, that is also a question so two stage exchange is the gold standard especially in patients on uh, immunosuppressive drugs and uh, uh, steroids so uh, romano et al compared uh, single stage versus two stage in uh, uh, in these cases in these uh, rheumatoid patients the success rate was 89.8% for uh, two stage and 81.9% in single stage so no major difference only a marginal difference so single stage Debridement and prosthetic replacement is not contraindicated, but again you go case to case. But two stage revision is the gold standard. So these are the uh, present criteria in case of dealing with the inflammatory arthritic patient with the prosthetic joint infection. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dana. Right. I'll hand you over to Ajit for his comments. I think. Um, it's been an excellent meeting uh, we've had some uh, very good talks from uh, dr uh, akrekar shashank akrekar on the very operative management of rheumatoid arthritis in a patient uh, sub, uh, to be subjected for uh, knee arthroplasty and then dr maria talking on uh, the various complexities uh, in a rheumatoid knee how to tackle them and of course our uh, star speaker today guest speaker from uh, Stanford, Dr. Christopher Mo, on uh, constraint in the knee. And I think all the talks have been very uh, illustrative, very illuminating, and uh, I think uh, all the uh, we are grateful to the people who came forward to present the cases, Dr. Dhanasekar Raja, Dr. Buddha, Dr. Pradeep, and Dr. Mohan Desai. Each uh, case uh, was unique in its own way. and i think there were a lot of learning points from each one of those uh, cases um, i must say more than one point in each case okay so it's been a wonderful uh, meeting and i'm uh, i must congratulate the president and on behalf of dr ronan roy and myself um, thank all the uh, panelists and the participants for being with us thank you very much uh thank you uh dr 
Ronan Roy and uh, Dr. Ajit Kumar. That was a fantastic webinar. And it's uh, breakfast time for uh, Chris and uh, dinner time for us. So everybody is tired now. So, but that was a fantastic thing, you know, that uh, both of you could conduct and uh, we got all the, you know, finer techniques uh, doing a totally arthroplasty rheumatoid patients. And I thank uh, uh, each one uh, of you, um, Chris, especially for uh, getting up early and joining this webinar as well as Dr. Maria for uh, his an elegant talk and uh, Dr. Sasang Akrekar for in spite of his evening OPD, he has to, you know, close down the OPD to attend this webinar and enlighten us about this, you know, about medical aspects of rheumatoid arthritis. And I thank all our faculty who presented, you know, excellent cases and uh, especially done in the last uh, lecture about the uh, infection related rheumatoid arthritis. Now, the next webinar will be webinar series number 10, which will be on the 17th November 2020. And our convener will be Dr. Krishna Kiran Achampati from uh, Hyderabad. And it will be devoted to managing acetabular bone loss in total hip replacement. Friends, every third Tuesday of every month, uh, we are holding this focused webinars related to arthroplasty. So we request you to join through the YouTube or Facebook, wherever you are. And I thank everybody and I close this session. And before closing, I must thank Dr. Abhinav Jogani, Assistant Professor in King Edward Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, who has been, you know, very instrumental in the, you know, in the background. He has been handling this uh, um, uh, Zoom meeting along with uh, YouTube as well as Facebook and especially Dr. You know, Syed uh, uh, Rahman also, my registrar who is in the background, which, who is not seen here. So both of them have been instrumental. So we thank you very much on behalf of Indian Arthroplasty Association and also to all the viewers who has been attending today. I thank you and I close this meeting. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.